morning. My name is Satna Garg. I'm a solicitor advocate and professional support lawyer. I'm going to be talking to you today um, about latest developments in professional negligence for solicitors. I'll look at the claims landscape as it stands, um, some common risk scenarios in which um, risk arises, how best to limit the scope of your duties to clients, um, the different facets of liability arising in contract and tort, some tips for how best to defend claims should the worst happen, um, the potential periods of exposure that solicitors face to claims in light of the Limitation Act, um, and what the SRA has been doing lately um, in terms of scrutinising solicitors' behaviour. So the claims landscape as it stands, um, are solicitors being sued more or less frequently in recent years? Well, the number of claims of solicitors has risen, according to Ministry of Justice statistics from 2016 to 2017, although there was a real height of claims in 2009 following the credit crunch. Um, the economic uncertainty following Brexit is likely to provide breeding ground for more claims, as mistakes in legal advice are not disguised by rising profits, parties are more likely to look to professionals' deeper pockets. Um, the separation of our law from EU law in due course will also add a layer of complexity and potentially give cause to claims. Third party funding has become commonplace in this jurisdiction. Professional negligence actions are very attractive to funders as they often they offer high, high value um, claims and a good return. Augusta Ventures quoted to the Gazette in 2016 that three quarters of the 56 cases it had funded since 2015 were for breach of contract or professional negligence, with more than half of the professional negligence claims being brought against solicitors. Collective actions are very much on the rise in this jurisdiction. Although we haven't yet seen collective actions against law firms, funding makes such actions more likely in the future. Momentum is apparently gathering for a class action against conveyancing firms by an ABS leasehold law, uh, where the firms have allegedly failed to advise properly on onerous ground rent clauses. The new self-certification regime has, as we know, replaced CPD points, and I'd suggest that this potentially gives rise to more claims. The Law Society has recently updated its guidance on continued competence and has emphasised that one's records are disclosable and that learning needs should be addressed as a matter of urgency. It really is very important to try to avoid claims being brought. The cost of defending them can be enormous. Electronic disclosure is particularly cumbersome and time consuming, and sometimes transactions under scrutiny um, are quite complex and multi-jurisdictional, which adds to the cost. Firms often face parallel proceedings on both civil and regulatory fronts, which can also be time consuming and draining. Thankfully, on the flip side, uh, the new disclosure regime um, might help reduce costs that's due to be piloted in 2019. Also, the pre-action professional negligence protocol now signposts parties to adjudication, which may also help to reduce the cost of dealing with claims. Just a quick note, across the pond, the United States has found many law firms being sued for massive cyber attacks and loss of client confidential data. This is a huge issue and one that UK firms should also be looking at quite urgently. So some common risk scenarios. Uh, property instructions seem to be a breeding ground for claims. Um, property fraud is also a rising problem and turning into a bit of a nightmare for conveyances. In the 2018 case of Dreamvar, the Court of Appeal held that the risk of property fraud lies with both the solicitors acting for the buyer and those acting for the seller. Family cases can give rise to claims arising out of, for example, high net worth divorces. Uh, private client work also can give rise to claims quite frequently, as well as advice in relation to new areas of law, such as Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and so on. So how do we lower the risk of claims being brought? Well, first and foremost, the retainer letter is critical in the process of reducing risk. This should always be in writing to avoid any later dispute over its terms. It should carefully define the scope of the solicitor's duty. In the Springwell case 2008, 
Judge Gloucester emphasised that the most important factor was how the parties had sought to regulate their relationship and allocate risk. The retainer letter should exclude areas on which the professional does not intend to advise. It must, of course, contain all the key information that is required by the SRA Code of Conduct. I won't propose to go through that now, but there are various mandatory outcomes um, and indicative behaviours that should be adhered to. Do be aware that your retainer will automatically contain some implied terms under the Sale of Goods and Services Act 1982 as to exercising reasonable care and skill, performing your duties within a reasonable time and making reasonable charges. Further terms may also be implied as a result of trade and custom, the official bystander test and previous consistent course of dealings. You should consider whether you owe a higher duty as a result of the terms of the contract. For example, you may be obliged to achieve a particular result for your client. A key issue to give careful thought to is whether or not you are obliged to provide advice to your client or merely information. If you are providing advice, are you guiding the client's whole decision-making process or just providing a small part of the information upon which it will rely? This was provided for in the House of Lords case of Sanco in 1996. There, the lender overlent monies on the strength of an overvaluation by a valuer. The court held that if the professional is advising on whether or not to enter the transaction, the solicitor must consider all relevant matters and protect the client against the full range of risks associated with it. If the solicitor is negligent, the, solicitor, the client may then claim all losses flowing from the transaction. That's in contrast to information cases where only a limited part of a range of information is provided. The client then forms his own decision whether or not to enter the deal. In that scenario, the professional is only liable for the financial consequences of the specific information provided, even if this information was critical to the client's decision to proceed. This approach was echoed in the later case of Denning and Greenhalgh Financial Services, where a pensions advisor did not advise on advice given eight years earlier by a different pensions advisor, and the High Court held that an extended duty to advise will only arise in obvious cases and there must be a strong and close nexus between the retainer and the thing that the claimant alleges the professional was obliged to advise upon. Similarly, in, in the Supreme Court case of BPE Solicitors and Hughes Holland of last year, the court focused on what duties fell within the professional's scope of duty and only holding him or her liable for the financial consequence of breaching those duties. However, the court was not so kind in the case of Maine and Giambrone law. It applied the decision of the Supreme Court in BPE, but in contrast found the solicitors to have been obliged to provide advice rather than information and were liable to pay full compensation to the claimants. Giambrone had claimed that it was a leading Italian law firm having specialist expertise in Italian off-plan property acquisitions, that it would conduct due diligence and ensure purchases had the benefit of bank guarantees as security. In fact, the guarantees provided were not compliant. The firm failed to advise properly on the preliminary contracts or conduct proper due diligence. They also failed to advise regarding the risk of mafia crime affecting the transaction. The project collapsed, the purchasers lost their deposits and 185 claimants brought claims against the firm. Lord Justice Jackson found that this was a Category 2 advice case since it was not a conventional conveyancing situation. Contrast um, this point with um, the situation where your client potentially is unsophisticated and inexperienced. This will affect the scope of your duty and will probably widen it. This was explained by Lord Scott in the, in the Privy Council decision of Pickersgill and Riley where he explained that a youthful client unversed in business affairs might need explanation and advice from his solicitor before entering into a commercial transaction. So do consider whether or not your client is experienced or inexperienced. Solicitors, thankfully, are not usually retained to give general business advice. This was established in the case of Midland Bank 
and Het, Stubbs and Kemp in 1979. It was echoed in Football League and Edge Ellison 2006, where the Football League claimed against Edge Ellison for negligently failing to take its instructions regarding whether it wanted guarantees of its opposing party's obligations. The court found the key question was what was within the scope of the solicitor's duty. And here the solicitors did not owe a general duty to advise the Football League generally on parent company guarantees, since the instructing parties at Football League were well aware of the risk of corporate insolvency and the advantages of obtaining guarantees. Similarly, in Tam Laura and Cameron McKenna of 2009, the court found the solicitors were not under a duty to explain the commercial effects of the agreed terms of the transaction, since the parties involved were experienced men of commerce. However, this is to be contrasted with Procter and Raleigh solicitors and is a, sounds a warning note to all solicitors to take care where your client is um, relatively unsophisticated. Here, the claim against solicitors was upheld by the Court of Appeal for failing to explain to the possibi possibility to the claimant minor of bringing a claim for compensation arising out of vibration white finger. The possibility had been explained in standard form letters but the court held that the situation cried out for a short discussion with the client to ensure he understood. This demonstrates the vastly different approach by the court where the client is not experienced and sophisticated. So some common risk scenarios, um, some more areas where risk arises. Consider whether or not a matter has been started with the correct level of lawyer. In Dunhill and Brook 2016, um, the undersettlement of a, of a personal injury matter by a barrister was criticised in the sense that had the instructed solicitors not sent a junior trainee, the solicitors may have detected the barrister's negligent error. Outsourcing of tasks can also give rise to the potential for claims where this is not done properly. For example, if a disclosure exercise is outsourced abroad and the, U the UK lawyer fails to properly explain what the reviewing team needs to look for, the instructing firm should also consider who will carry out the work and how it will be properly supervised. There are also obvious risks in relation to data security and checks should be carried out to ensure that the outsourcer um, has taken proper measures to protect that information. You should also check whether or not it has adequate insurance in case there is a breach. Returning to solicitor's duties, think about whether or not the, the duty you owe is a continuing one. The relevance of this point is that the limitation period for bringing an action based on that error will run from the latest date that the error should have been rectified. I'd suggest it's sensible to review your files on a regular basis and ensure that any errors are corrected. Unfortunately, in the Midland Bank Trust case, um, the solicitors were found to owe a continuing duty to register an option to purchase a farm every day after the deed granting the tenure option had been executed until the tenure period had expired. Thankfully, the court's approach has softened in later cases in Capita and RFIB. Um, the Court of Appeal held that if the solicitor fails to give correct advice, his continuing failure to correct that advice does not give rise to a fresh course of action. And similarly, in Worthing and Worthing and Lloyds Bank, the claimants claimed that Lloyds had been negligent by recommending an investment not suited to their appetite for risk. To get, um, they had a limitation problem, and to get around this, the claimants argued that a new breach of duty arose every time that Lloyds failed to reconsider and correct its investment advice. However, the High Court found that once Lloyds had given its original advice, the duty of care on it was discharged and would only be continuing if the claimants could identify a contractual obligation that remained unperformed. And the court felt this did not con contradict Midland Bank, as in that case, there was a failure to perform a contractual duty, which was the registration of the option. Nevertheless, I'd suggest this is an area to keep a close eye on. Might you be liable to parties who are not your clients? We're all familiar with the third party rule or the rule on privity of contract, which means that anyone not privy to the contract cannot sue or be sued on it. However, there are certain situations where third parties may bring claims. 
Does your retainer letter confer a benefit on a third party? If it does, that third party may claim under the contract pursuant to the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. The third party doesn't even need to be in existence when the contract is entered. The effect of the Act may be excluded uh, by the contracting parties, and I suggest that this is probably best practice for solicitors' terms of engagement. Could there be an implied retainer between you and a third party uh, where there is no express contract? Generally, the court will only imply such a retainer where it's objectively fair and proper in all the circumstances. The issue was considered in Caliendo and Mishkondorea, and the court found the, fact, the following factors are relevant. Firstly, whether the solicitor was paid or would be paid, whether that party had previously instructed it, uh, whether it had instructed other professional advisers, and finally, whether there is evidence of advice being sought or given to that party. Has the solicitor, have you potentially assumed responsibility to someone other than your direct client? For example, you may have been instructed by an agent, um, such as another law firm, on behalf of its client. This can throw up some really interesting issues as to whom the solicitor owes its duties. Is the contract between it and the agent, the firm, or is it between it and the agent's principal, its client? If the contract's only with the instructing party, the problem arises that there is the likelihood that the solicitor will nevertheless owe a duty of care to the ultimate client, but has no contractual relationship with it. Therefore, any contractual exclusions or limitations, such as caps on liability, will not apply. In Steele and Enram of this year, the Supreme Court um, provides some reassurance by finding that borrower solicitors did not owe a duty of care to a lender for misstatements uh, regarding how a loan would be repaid. This was given that the solicitor had not assumed responsibility for the accuracy of the statements. It had not been reasonable for the lender to rely on them without independent inquiry. And the solicitor could not have foreseen that the lender would so rely. I would suggest, however, that where a solicitor is instructed by another party, such as a law firm, knowing that there is a high degree of probability that the advice will be relied on by its client, these factors rather work against it, such that a duty of care probably does arise. Do you owe a duty to your opponent? Generally, no, um, but there's always the possibility that if you have stepped outside your role as solicitor for your client and assumed a direct responsibility, um, that you may owe such a duty. And I would refer you back to the case I just went through, Steele and Enram, which sets out um, the criteria for establishing whether or not that has occurred. In the context of court proceedings, two very recent cases of this year, Woodward and Phoenix and Barton and Wright Hassel considered whether or not a solicitor owed a duty to the other side. Um, in both cases, the claimants had attempted to serve proceedings, uh, but had done so very close to the deadline for doing so and had done so defectively. Um, and in both cases, the court found that the defendant solicitor was not under a duty to point out the error. Um, in fact, to do so would deprive um, the the defendant of a potential limitation defence. So it was definitely not something that the defendant solicitor had to do. This provides quite a bit of comfort to um, solicitors who are acting in the course of court proceedings. Can you limit or exclude your potential liability to your clients um, or third parties? The answer is most definitely you can. Um, so long as you don't fall foul of the various restrictions set out in the Unfair Terms, uh, the Unfair, Con Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977. Um, I won't propose to go through these in any great detail, um, since I'm sure you're all familiar with them. However, do, in, do make sure that um, the limitations or exclusions you put in are likely to be reasonable. Um, adhering to the, um, the limit on an on insurance, the minimum level of cover required by the solicitor indemnity insurance rules is clearly important. Um, and do double check that your client is not a consumer. A consumer is an individual acting for purposes wholly or mainly outside that individual's trade, business, craft or profession. Um, see the Consumer Rights Act 2015 in that case. 
um, which supplies a complete code on unfair terms in consumer contracts. The international angle um, may give rise to claims. Um, for example, where a firm is thinking of setting up shop overseas, it should bear in mind that where it has such a hub and spoke system, there is a risk of the head office being sued as a result of mistakes committed by satellite offices abroad. The firm should think carefully about the expertise and experience levels of the partners and staff to avoid the situation where a lawyer finds himself being asked to advise on areas outside his normal expertise. So give some thought to how to ring fence liabilities of um, the head office from the other offices. Do also take care in instructing foreign firms, even if they're not part of your firm network. Um, in the case of Simrise and Baker McKenzie LLP, um, the defendant conceded that it's, its responsibility when instructing a local firm in a foreign jurisdiction was not limited to simply choosing and instructing it, but did extend to ensuring that the local firm took care when giving its advice. Some instructions may have an international element or angle. Um, lawyers operating outside their home country may fail to appreciate differences between the understanding and expectations of clients in different regions. I mentioned already the Gianbrone case of 2016, where an Italian lawyer was held negligent for failing to advise UK investors um, in Italian property of the need for enhanced due diligence. It failed, he failed to appreciate the mafia's involvement in the construction industry in that region. Do also take great care with cross-border contracts um, to make sure that you have advised on proper jurisdiction and choice of law to avoid um, your client being dragged into a dispute in a different jurisdiction um, later down the line. So does it matter if a claimant brings his claim in tort um, or a contract or in both? Um, well, in most cases, solicitors are likely to owe a concurrent duty in both. And as I mentioned, uh, the, Spring, the Springwell case, Judge Gloucester emphasised that the important factor was how the parties had sought to regulate their relationship. And if they'd done so by contract, this would indicate that there is no wider tortious duty. So that case is quite helpful. However, the duty in tort may not always be on all fours with the contractual duty owed to one's clients. For example, the contract may impose more onerous obligations than the duty of tort. And conversely, a duty in tort may arise where there is no express or implied retainer with the party. Um, see Caliendo and Mishkondorea there, where the solicitors were held to owe a limited duty of care to third parties. Sometimes a duty in, court, in tort may not arise. This may happen where the tortious duty is so at odds with that owed under the contract that parties are taken to have limited or excluded the duty in tort. Henderson and Merritt Syndicates 94 is authority for that. Different limitation periods can apply to each course of action. Uh, where there is a breach of duty, this will often enable the claimant to claim both breach of contract and a breach of duty of care. This can be helpful if the limitation period for the tort action expires later than the limitation period for the breach of contract action. This is six years from the date of breach of contract, whereas it's six years from uh, the date of breach and damage where the claim is in tort. Apart from the limitation angle, claimants may also benefit from bringing their claim under both heads, since the damages and the way they are assessed is slightly different for each course of action, despite both having a fundamentally compensatory aim. Where the claimant claims breach of contract, this will entitle him to claim expectation or loss of bargain damages, uh, which may exceed compensatory damages payable for a tortious breach of duty, which aim, of course, to restore the claimant back to the position he was in before the breach of duty occurred. For liability in tort negligence, of course, there needs to be a duty of care. In turn, an assumption of responsibility to the party um, and reliance by that party on the professional's assumption of responsibility. Um, whether or not there has been such an assumption is judged objectively. And as I've already um, pointed to, the duty of care owed may extend beyond just the solicitor's immediate client. 
It all depends very much on to whom the solicitor has assumed responsibility. This is a very fact dependent question. It's difficult to draw hard and fast rules as to when or well, when not a duty of care will arise. But the good news is that the court is generally slow to impose duties of care towards parties other than direct clients. In Mann, Nutz, Farzeuger and Freightliner of 2007, the court held that simply foreseeing that a recipient would rely on a statement by the solicitor was not enough. Contrast this, unfortunately, with some more recent cases, um, apologies, not more recent, but some other cases, Riyadh Bank and Ali, United Bank, um, White and Jones of 95 and Rothschild and Berenson of 97, where the court was not so kind in the last case, um, Rothschild and Berenson, the, the Court of Appeal held that the solicitor owed a duty to a consortium of banks funding its client, despite the solicitor's negligent fund request only being seen by one bank. Of course, uh, reasonable foreseeability and proximity will have to be satisfied. Um, solicitors should be very wary about giving free advice to friends. Um, there's been a recent case, Burgess and Lejon Van, on this, where an architect was held to owe a duty to his friend in tort, despite there being no contract between them. And if you do feel concerned that you may be found to owe a duty to third parties, um, consider trying your best to um, contract out. Of course, it, the difficulty is that there's no direct contract with a third party who's not party to your retainer. Um, but then in that scenario, consider putting a appropriately worded disclaimer in your advice or statements. So the court will look at whether or not the, the duty of care has been breached and will ask whether the solicitor has made an error which no reasonable member of his profession would have made in the circumstances. What is the relevant standard of care? Well, in negligence, the standard is that of the reasonable man, judged objectively and by the standards in place at the time the advice was given. In Barker and Baxendale, the Court of Appeal held that the solicitors should have warned their client that a tax avoidance scheme might fail. The risk related to the solicitor's interpretation of legislation. However, Lord Justice Aplin pointed out that even if a solicitor has adopted a non-negligent interpretation, they can still be under a duty to point out the risk that that interpretation might not be upheld. This duty is more likely to arise if litigation is on foot or the point has already been taken. The issue is not one of percentages or whether opposing possible constructions are finely balanced, but Lord Aplin explained that the test is more nuanced than that. Expert evidence is sometimes admitted where the allegedly negligent advice was in a specialist area or on foreign law. If you don't have, if the solicitor doesn't have the requisite knowledge um, for the instruction, there is a duty on that solicitor to obtain it, and that was established by Central Trust and Refuse, 1983. Factors affecting the standard of care, um, the level of experience of the solicitor is not a relevant factor. The standard is the reasonably competent solicitor. The solicitor will, however, be held up to a higher standard if he has held himself out to be a specialist. This was established by the 7th Earl of Malmesbury and Strutton Parker. Solicitors should also comply with professional standards, of course. Um, this SRA Code of Conduct 2011 should be looked at and solicitors should be familiar with its terms. Breach of those terms is arguably also a breach of a statutory duty, which the claimant may claim damages for. So some tips on how best to successfully defend claims should the worst happen and a claim be brought. It sounds trite, but keeping attendance notes is genuinely an excellent thing to do. Lawyers are increasingly relying on emails as rec records of their conversations with clients, but the detail of what was advised may not be fully reflected in email exchanges, and a properly drafted attendance note will usually be more comprehensive. It makes it much easier to rebut claimant assertions later on down the line when allegations are made, years later, for example, when memories have faded. Solicitors should also have a reliable system for storing documents on a client's file. 
Many firms have electronic filing systems which may or may not be used reliably, and this can create evidential problems um, later on when it's difficult to find documents, and this will also drive up the cost of defending a claim. Of course, ensure that a retainer letter is sent to clients uh, together with standard terms of business, signed and sent back and kept safe. If there's no such letter, it does make it very difficult to argue that the scope of work was curtailed to certain matters and not others, or that there was a cap on liability in place. If the instruction has a cross-border element, such as where the client is based in a foreign jurisdiction, the lack of terms of business specifying where disputes should be heard, for example, this jurisdiction, risks the solicitor being pulled into litigation elsewhere. So how to defend yourself? Can you defend yourself on the basis you relied on a specialist? Langsam and Beechcroft, 2012, um, held that a solicitor can't really hide behind counsel's advice and does have a duty to consider whether or not that advice is obviously or glaringly wrong. Might you be able to defend yourself on the basis that the client is tainted with illegality? Um, this may be available, however, the test um, for illegality has changed um, following Patel and Mirza of 2016, which restated the test and overruled the previous reliance test, which you may be familiar with in Lip Tinsley and Milligan, finding that claims won't be enforced if to do so would be harmful to the integrity of the legal system. So a little bit vague and open-ended and not necessarily something that will apply. Might you be able to defend yourself on the basis you are acting for the benefit of society heroically or in uh, connection with a desirable activity? If you think you were, then take a look at both the Social Action Responsibility and Heroism Act and the Compensation Act, which might avail um, you of a defence. Causation. The but for test, would the claimant have acted the same way regardless of your advice? In Tayuta International and De Villiers surveyors, the Supreme Court found that a value was not liable for more than the difference that his negligent valuation made, and that limited his loss. That's in contrast, however, to where a solicitor advises that um, his client has a claim which is likely to succeed at, at trial. In Levicom International, um, it was held that if a solicitor advises that his client has a strong case to start litigation rather than settle a dispute and the client goes on to commence proceedings, the normal inference is that the solicitor's advice is causative of the client's loss. Might you be able to point to another cause for the loss? The onus is on the defendant solicitor to show that the other possible causes were at least as likely to have caused the loss. If none of the competing causes are inherently likely on a balance of probabilities, though, the claimant will not succeed. Might there be an intervening act which helps to break the chain of causation? That won't help the solicitor, though, if the intervening act or event was something that the solicitor was supposed to guard against. Does the loss claimed flow from breach of duty inside or outside the scope of the professional's duty? This goes back to what I was saying about SAMCO, which establishes that the professional is only liable for those losses flowing from his or her scope of duty. Don't forget to consider alleging contributory negligence by the claimant under the Contributory Negligence Act. This can apply to both breach of contract and breach of duty, uh, tortious breach of duty. However, just beware that as far as breach of contract claims go, the defendants can only rely on this act if the contract provision breached depended on the defendant's negligence or is a provision to take care and corresponds to the equivalent duty of care in tort. The Civil Liability Contribution Act 1978 allows defendants to seek a contribution from other parties, and this is important to consider. For example, where a surveyor is held liable to the lender and seeks to claim a contribution from the lender's solicitors. So some more common risk scenarios, particularly applicable to litigators. Um, deadlines are a common cause for complaint and claims where a solicitor has failed to adhere um, and comply with a deadline. Lost litigation claims, such as where a solicitor fails to advise on all the possible claims that could have been brought against a party. That takes us into the loss of chance territory, which I'll come on to shortly. 
and also the undersettlement of claims, as seems to be particularly the case with personal injury matters, can give rise to an action for negligence later on. Complex areas of law are obvious um, areas where claims may be brought since um, the law is difficult and changing and uh, mistakes can easily occur. Sanctions law advice, um, international sanctions often disallow the transfer of funds to a sanctioned country um, and law firms often are, are often asked to advise on this quite complex area. Tax and pensions, um, for example, in relation to failed tax avoidance schemes, um, negligence claims may be brought there and uh, pensions advice can often give rise to claims as it is um, subject to frequent change and this can lead to incorrect advice being given. Clients may argue that they were not given proper risk warnings about entering into a scheme, for example, and did not understand what they were agreeing to. So what can a claimant actually claim for? Um, damages are assessed at the date of breach, although the ways in which loss is measured differ between contract and tort, damages, uh, the intention of damages is essentially compensatory. This is subject to the, the rules on remoteness. Um, it's for the claimant to prove on the balance of probabilities what it would have done but for the breach. However, um, where the claimant argues that it lost a chance of avoiding a loss or gaining something, the allied ma Maples principle will then apply and the claimant must show that had the third party done what the claimant claims he should have done, the claimant would have had a real or substantial chance, rather than a speculative one, of achieving a goal. If the claimant successfully demonstrates that he has lost that chance, the court will evaluate it and apply it to assess the damages payable. These sorts of loss of chance cases are notoriously difficult. It can be really challenging for the court to evaluate the chance without conducting effectively a trial within a trial. In Barnaby and Raleigh's, the solicitor's negligence caused the client to lose the chance to pursue a claim, which would have had a 75% chance of success. The claimant was awarded damages, which equated, therefore, to 75% of the estimated value of that claim. Wellesley Partners and Withers, uh, also considered the same loss of chance principle. But don't fear unduly, there are limits to the applicability of this principle. The loss must not be too remote. Um, that was established in Wright and Lewis Silkin 2016, where the, the Court of Appeal found the solicitors were not liable for failing to include a jurisdiction clause in an employment contract, where the claimant claimed that this failure led to delays in enforcing an English judgment against its counterparty, which meant in turn that by the time it could be enforced, the judgment debtor was insolvent. The court will look at what was in the reasonable contemplation of the parties when assessing loss. Um, the classic case of Hadley and Baxendale of 1854 provides that losses um, must be foreseeable, but not merely possible. That means they should be not unlikely. When working out um, these losses, the parties are assumed to have contemplated things that usually happen in the ordinary course of things, as well as special circumstances outside the normal course of things, but which were communicated to the defendant um, or were otherwise known by the parties. The court will also look at um, what the defendant professional has assumed responsibility for, and that draws upon the previous case law I was mentioning, Samco and BP solicitors. Um, this was emphasised in uh, Transfield Shipping, the Achilleus case. Um, so this appears to be the modern approach to assessing what um, losses the professional is liable for. It's an intensely fact sensitive exercise. Um, and as Lord Justice Arden put it in Johnson and Gore Wood, every case is likely to, to depend on the range of matters for which the defendant assumed responsibility having regard to the particular facts. The types of losses that may be claimed for breach of contract, I won't go into chapter and verse here, but basically items such as cost of cure, diminution in value, lost management time, lost profits, wasted expenditure. As regards breach of tortious duty, foreseeable economic losses may be recovered in order to restore the claimant to the pre-breach of duty position 
Although note uh, that as a result of the difference in measure of damages between the two heads, lost profits are unlikely to be recoverable for negligence. The liability to compensate is not limitless. Um, as I've said, there is a remoteness um, test that will be applied to prevent um, further losses being recovered. Um, Wellesley Partners and Withers helpfully clarified that the remoteness test is now the same for breach of duty in tort and in contract. So um, where the contractual and tortious duties to take care exist side by side, the range, the extent to which losses are recoverable will be the same. This is really good news for solicitors who will usually be facing concurrent liability under both heads. Mitigation, the, the defendant solicitor should always ask whether the claimant mitigated its loss and the burden will be on the solicitor to show that the claimant failed to take all reasonable steps to minimise or avert loss. Can solicitors be liable for distress caused by their advice? Thankfully, no, that was established in Clark and Turnbull last year. How long might solicitors be exposed to claims? Well, under the Limitation Act, um, the limitation period is six years from the date of breach of contract, and for tort, six years from the accrual of the cause of action, which effectively means once substantial damage has been suffered following the breach of duty. This can mean that the period is slightly longer than that arising from a breach of contract. There may also, of course, be an extended limitation period where the claimant is not aware of the damage caused, and that's under Section 14A of the Limitation Act 1980, subject to a long stop of 15 years from the date of the negligent act. This was intended to help claimants, this provision, um, where the damage occurred wasn't known to the claimant um, until it was too late to bring a claim within the original six years. However, unfortunately, it's led to a floodgate of claims in the professional negligence context over its precise meaning. Thankfully, uh, the case of Howard and Fawcett's of 2006 helps professionals by emphasising that the claimant needn't have precise knowledge uh, for time to begin to run. It held that the claimant had acquired the requisite knowledge to bring its claim when it knew in broad terms the facts upon which its claim was based. There may be an extended limitation period if the court adjudges that the damage was purely contingent. Um, this is not so good for solicitors. This was established in the, the case of Law Society in Sefton in 2006 where the House of Lords felt that where the damage is purely contingent, time does not start to run for claims brought in negligence until there is actual loss. This effectively means that the six year period may not start to run um, from the original date that the advice was provided and instead from a much later date. Thankfully, though, this uh, authority has been, uh, has been applied strictly in later cases and courts will not generally willingly find that damage is purely contingent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, claimants may also argue that, or attempt to argue, that the solicitor owed a continuing duty, which in turn might mean that the uh, limitation period runs from a later date. It looks as though this type of argument is unlikely to be successful since the courts seem reluctant to allow claimants to circumvent limitation um, using this argument. As I mentioned, Worthing and Lloyds Bank um, is helpful in that regard. So that's it in terms of um, a quick run through of uh, professional negligence. Um, just touching briefly before I finish on the SRA, it appears that the SRA has been quite a bit more active in recent years. Um, it will respond to promptly to reports of issues relating to firms and the CULP regime means that issues are now being more frequently reported. There's also the prospect um, of the possible lowering um, of the standard of proof for disciplinary action from cr the criminal standard of beyond reasonable doubt to the civil standard of on a balance of probabilities and this is definitely not helpful for solicitors. Um, parallel civil and regulatory proceedings are quite common. Um, this can create tricky issues in relation to the disclosure of documents. Documents will obviously be created in the investigation, in any re regulatory investigation. So firms must consider which documents are protected by privilege and which are not. 
If they are not, they then may be disclosable in any subsequent or parallel civil or criminal proceedings brought against the firm. Um, the recent privilege decision of SFO and the ENRC of this year is helpful, though, um, and enabled litigation privilege to be asserted where um, criminal proceedings were in prospect. So this is helpful. This is a helpful case to solicitors. Um, nevertheless, um, it can be extremely draining to deal with both sets of proceedings, and it may not be easy to get one set stayed while the other proceeds, and firms may have to fight both uh, at the same time. Some common misbehaviours, um, which the, the SRA routinely looks at, uh, relate to the improper use of client account, solicitors acting with a lack of integrity, undertakings, and uh, there's been a rash of cases recently on solicitors failing to advise clients properly regarding funding issues, funding options, and costs of matters. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar. It's been a pleasure. Um, that's it from me. If you have any questions, um, I would be delighted to hear from you and I'll try my very best to answer them. And equally, I'd be very interested in hearing from you with war stories about where you've experienced um, yourself or colleagues having difficulties with um, scope of duty issues and um, cl clients claiming that um, something was done improperly. Thank you very much.